We're leading our discussion up to larger matters, and matters that actually are of great concern to the world around us. <clears throat> at the moment, we want to look at some uh, approaches that appear to us to ultimately be capable of undermining Christianity and the teaching of Christianity. And some of those are uh, ideological approaches to science and to humanity, to the concept of humanity. The human person is really a great mystery. There are so many aspects to humanity that remain to us almost incomprehensible. Each one of us is a mystery, and we're a mystery most of all to ourselves. When we start talking about uh, the human condition, how people grow up, how they develop, we talk about, uh, there was an argument about how much environment and how much um, inheritance, how much genetics, how much was in, uh, of a person's behavior and orientation was inherited. And some of these uh, arguments were really quite gross. There were, at one time, clear scientific arguments claiming to prove that black people were incapable of adult thought, that they were incapable of integrity, that they were incapable of really creative thought, that they should always be treated like dishonest uh, adolescents, which was the highest level to which their minds could rise. There were similar studies demonstrating why women should not be given the vote or be allowed to hold office because they also were not capable of completely adult thought and emotions and ways of handling things. So very often, in many societies, if a woman became a widow, she was not allowed to handle her own financial affairs or even take most of her own decisions. Her eldest son or the eldest male member of the family took control of her affairs because obviously, being a woman, she was incompetent. No one explains to us how we got Queen Elizabeth I, who was quite competent, or uh, Zenobia uh, Petra, who conquered Egypt, or some of these other great women in history. But many of them prove that women can be just as cruel and barbarous as men, and certainly just as clever, resourceful, and intelligent as men. Nevertheless, we were laboring under these, these impressions. When people argue about nurture or nature, about environment, that is, how environment shapes people, they usually forget that the womb is also an environment, and that the shaping and learning which a child undergoes begins already in the womb, and many factors that affect the fetus and the womb are going to be visible when the child grows up, when they develop. So we get a lot of uh, religious people arguing about genetics, saying, well, there's no gene for this, there's no gene for that, there's no excuse for this, there's no excuse for that. And they really don't know what they're talking about. Of course, there's no gene for the childhood disease retinoblastoma, that is the cancerous tumors that some babies are born with in their eyes and which eventually kill them. There's no gene for that. There's no gene for many of the uh, things that children are born with, suffer from, and die from. There are genes that program for certain reactions in the body, for certain chemicals to be produced, for certain minerals to be produced, when those minerals or chemicals are not produced, then these illnesses result from the absence of some substance which a gene was supposed to code for production of. 
not because there was a gene for that specific illness or that specific condition. Also, we have identical twins who have genes which pre predispose them to a, a hereditary illness, a genetic illness. One may get it, the other not, even though they have the same genes. Because there are epigenetic switches, that is, little switches, I'll go into the more technical details of them later. There are little switches on the genes that turn them on or off. If in one twin this corrupted gene is turned on, he's going to develop the illness. If the epigenetic switch doesn't turn the gene on in the other twin, he won't develop it. And so when we start talking about science and religion, and people begin to argue ideological points of view from things they've heard or bits and pieces they've picked up in science, then we do run the risk of undermining every one of our arguments. There is no absolute black and white in the human condition. All human beings are shades of gray. We cannot fall into the scholastic notion that we can legislate even the mysteries of human existence and that we could set them forth in some kind of scientific terminology. Humanity is a mystery, just as quantum physics is a mystery. And the more deeply we penetrate into that mystery, the deeper the mystery becomes. Not because what we experience is not real, not because what we encounter is not real, but because it's a portion of what we call reality. As a matter of fact, when we speak about reality, this reality is often just an adjective with aspirations to be a noun, or masquerading as a noun. I think that when we speak of reality, we're always using an adjective and never a noun because reality is modifying something, some other noun. And my reality, her reality, his reality, uh, somebody else's reality. And so we're using it as it, perhaps in the wrong way. So what I want to caution, and I, I'm sure I'll get a number of letters or notes about this, is that we not try to have Whig science and Whig theology. That we not try to pretend that certain scientific theories substantiate our religious ideologies. When religion is reduced to an ideology, it loses its power for truth. It loses the ability to convey any genuine meaning. It locks a person in to the lowest level of belief. A level of belief that very often does not include genuine faith. So I want to caution again about this and we're going to expand and we're going to use in more technical terms many of the things that we said in oversimplified terms now. But I'm trying to set a little bit of a stage for us, a little bit of a vocabulary in which we realize that we're not simply rummaging through science manuals, trying to find something that appears to vaguely substantiate something in Scripture. Scripture is about meaning, and it's this meaning that we're after in Scripture. Science is about not about discovering the essence of nature, but discovering what, we can, what it is that we can know about nature. And when we think that science is trying to unfold the essence of nature, it's as blind as saying that orthodox theology is trying to discern and understand the essence of God. So let's bear these things in mind as we continue our, our voyage into this subject. And be patient, we'll get into these more controversial and bigger subjects. Uh, it's just that we only have about eight minutes of recording time for each of these videos. And I want to set a premise and set uh, some kind of a direction before you that we're going to follow.